Hello, good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, this is Ted from Rogin Medical. As you all know, we are a manufacturer of endodontic rotary files and other uh, endodontic uh, instruments uh, from China. And today we are honored to invite uh, uh, Dr. Wally Curdy to uh, speak uh, for us and his topic today is 60 minutes uh, from drilling to filling. I, I think I don't need to say uh, much about uh, uh, Dr. Curry because uh, you all are very familiar with uh, him. He's an endodontist uh, uh, with a rich experience in RTC treatment. And uh, now I will hand over uh, to uh, Dr. Curry and uh, our webinar today starts. Thank you, Ted. Thank you very much for this great introduction. Uh, hello, everyone, and good morning, or good evening, or good afternoon, wherever you are now in this world. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about uh, some sort of basic endodontics. I'm going to talk about uh, this presentation of uh, 60 minutes from drilling to filling. Just one second to open the presentation. Okay. All right, I guess huh? I guess that everything is perfect now. And I guess that everybody can see the presentation. Okay. We can start. All right, okay, we can start. Today, I guess that everybody can hear my voice and everything is good, everything's fine, so let's start. Today, I'm going to talk with all of you about more or less basic endodontics from your axis cavity, from your drilling, up to the obturation or the filling in 60 minutes. Our main goal or our main aim of this lecture is to make the root canal treatment, especially of vital cases or even necrotic cases with dry canal, to do it in 60 minutes or one single visit in one hour, nothing more. And in this, of course, we will need to consider a very effective and safe and good rotary files and indeed a more easier obturation technique. That's why we can save some more time for the main concept of irrigation because we all know that more or less root canal treatment, it's more or less about irrigation and the chemical irrigation of the root canal. So let's start. First of all, up till now, unfortunately, we still have COVID-19. So please take care of yourself. And we used to say, wear your mask, stay home, stay safe, but now no, none anymore. Now get the vaccination, wear your mask, and we have to move on. The protocols that I'm going to share today, I already shared in a lot of countries all over the world that was in Albania, Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia, Albania, Poland, 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 Morocco, India, Serbia, Bangladesh, Lithuania, India, and Lithuania, Poland, 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 a lot of Poland. First of all, because of this great guy, as I always mention him in all my webinars or lectures because he is a great or he is the godfather of endodontics in Poland and I always consider him as a mentor for me. His name is Dr. Jerry from Poland. 
Now let's move to our presentation. First of all, this is the outline of our lecture today. I need to make the whole 60 minutes or to divide the whole 60 minutes on the following. First of all, for preparation of the area and to give the anesthesia and to make the rubber dam and to arrange everything, we will make it in 10 minutes. You can arrange your patient, you can give the anesthesia, take the time for the anesthesia to be effective and working, and then get the rubber dam isolation, prepare it, you or even your assistant, and that will take maximum 10 minutes. Then after that, we will start our access cavity that it should or will should take maybe five minutes, maximum 10 minutes. And I will show you how to do this exactly on the next slides. And then after that, we have to take our lens, our working lens, the lens that I'm working with. And indeed, in this step, we will talk about the X-ray and the uh, Apex locator. And then after that, shaping. And here, we have to consider that the whole shaping will not take more than five to 10 minutes. The whole shaving procedure that we are going to focus on today with Rogen rotary files, or even whatever the nickel titanium rotary files of Rogen that we are going to use today, then the main time we will give for the irrigation, 20 minutes for the irrigation, and I will mention the irrigation protocol, and at the end, the opturation in just 10 minutes. This is the outline of the 60 minutes that we are going to use today in our lecture. So the main goal, as I said, one hour for everything from drilling to filling. First of all, the axis cavity. To make the right and the proper axis cavity, we need certain tools. First, indeed, is the good magnification and the illumination tool, like microscope, like uh, uh, eye loops, whatever the magnification and the illumination tool you are using in your clinic. I know that ev not everyone is using microscope. So even with your uh, naked eyes or with uh, loops, it will be much more bitter, not only for the magnification, but also for the illumination. Then the tooth isolation with the rubber dam indeed, the hand bees that we are going to use and the bear, round bear, I know that everybody knows this. We have to use a round rose head bear just to make the throb. And then after that, we do the whole coronal, uh, sorry, the whole uh, def, uh, deroofing of the uh, coronal part of the bulb chamber with endozipair or whatever the fissure bear you are going to use. But we have to remember that we need to remove the cares first. Then the endodontic explorer, and this is very important, especially to identify the middle mesial and the mesiopacal two canals, and we are going to talk about that also, and ultrasonic device. So what kind of access cavity, access cavity do we need? We know, we all know that recently we have a lot of types of axis cavity. We have the conventional axis cavity, we have conservative conventional axis cavity, we have truss axis, we have ninja axis. Tomorrow I can make any kind of holes or super holes and call it cordy axis. Okay, I'm not against all of that, but the main importance for me is can you make this kind of access cavity in a daily clinical practice in every case without causing any mishaps? If you can do this, it's fine. Do whatever the access cavity that you are going to do. The guys who did truss or ninja access, they claim that this will increase or enhance the structural integrity of the tooth after root canal treatment. But unfortunately, most of the studies talking about that are in vitro studies and they are neglecting more factors, more important factors like, for example, 
the uh, uh, occlusal uh, stresses or the occlusal forces, like for example, that the tooth outside the patient mouth or in vitro, it's completely different than with the periodontal ligament inside the patient mouth. They are neglecting a lot of important factors. That's why for me, the most important rule up till now is to have straight line access. But the most important is straight line access to what? Straight line access to the orifice or to the curve or the first curve or to the apex. Actually, for the orifice, any hole will make it to the orifice. And to the apex, indeed, none. It's not reliable or not clinical because we don't have straight canals, even if the root that contains a canal is a straight, this doesn't mean that the root canal is a straight. So we have to make a straight line axis at least to the first curve. What are the objectives or the main objective of axis cavity? That's why we can consider it's better to make the axis cavity with truss or ninja or the conventional conservative uh, axis cavity. The objectives of the axis cavity is to have straight line axis, as we said, at least to the first curve and to locate all the canals and also to be conservative, to, to, to save the tooth structure. The principles of the coronal cavity preparation, as we all know, outline four, the size of the pulp chamber, the shape of the pulp chamber, the number and position of curvatures of the root canals, for example, the size of the pulp chamber. We all know that the size of the pulp chamber may vary from a case to another. For example, if you have deep restoration or deep carious lesion, maybe there is a secondary or tertiary dentine that can be formed and that will make the pulp chamber size smaller. But also in some cases we have turodontism and we can see the pulp chamber is bigger. That's why we need to know the size of the pulp chamber because it affects the outline form. The shape of the bulb chamber, we all know this, triangular cross, uh, sorry, triangular shape, uh, axis cavity and trapezoidal, and then the molar oval in the anterior triangular. We all know this. The main important idea is to understand the anatomy of the pulp canal system of all the teeth. And of course, we all know this. Also number and position and curvature of the pulp chamber, because we have a lot of variations. Sometimes we can see molarized premolar. Sometimes we can see a molar with one or two canals. That's why we always say anatomy is variant. So how you can tell me that I can make ninja or truss axis in every case in a daily clinical practice without losing a lot of time to be or to work like this or without combium CT preoperatively, how you can be sure that there is no messed canal or there is no messed anatomy. I'm not against this kind of access cavity, but if you can convince me to do it in the right way in a daily clinical practice, in every case in my daily work, I will do it. All right. Convenience for, and this is the most important for me for the axis cavity. For the, in, for the convenience form, we have to have unobstructed access to the canal orifice, direct access to the apical curvature or whatever, if we have double curvature, complete authority over the shaping or enlarging instrument or the rotary instrument that I'm going to use. And also sometimes we can do extension to accommodate for obturation or even for shaping. For example, look at this case here. And I will point here on this lower isolated third molar. Here you can see that the axis is mainly distal. If I did not do this flaring to the wall or the mesial wall here, before I start my shaping or my obturation, indeed I will not be able to, I will not be able to shape the whole canal or to negotiate the second curve. That's why I always say that this is, that is very important to make your axis cavity as convenient as it will help you to do the shaping and the obturation. 
Another very important topic is to completely remove the cares and the old filling in the canal, or sorry, in the tooth before you start. Because sometimes you can remove the cares, you can remove the previous restoration, and you will find that the tooth is untreatable. The tooth is unsavable. You cannot save the tooth, it's, or it's, um, let's say untreatable. So you have to remove the curse first, not only because I am not allowing more bacteria inside uh, the canal when I'm doing my shaving, but also, also, and this is very important to see if the, the tooth is hopeless or untreatable or not. So please remove all the cares and all the old feelings before you start. It's very, very, very important toilet of the cavity. And that's why we always say, sometimes we do uh, the coronal pre buildup, and this just to make like a, a, a path for the sodium hypochlorite to toilet the whole cavity and also to help us when we start the shaving inside the root canal that will increase the debridement of the bacteria with the irrigation indeed. This is a very, very, very important and nice systematic review talking about and comparing the types of the axis cavity. I advise all of you to see it. It's very nice and very important. You can uh, see it. Uh, it's already free on internet. You can see it. And the research question was, is there an improvement in the fracture resistance or structural integrity between truss and conservative axis cavity and ultra conservative axis cavity rather than the traditional axis cavity? And the conclusion was, of course not. Of course not. And by the way, this systematic review was talking about everything, about the amount of debridement in, in every axis cavity, the amount of problems that may happen in the apical part with this kind of axis cavity. And the conclusion was, please keep it in your mind. Make your axis cavity as small as practical, as small as convenient, as small as will not affect or harm in your working lens determination, working lens shaving, working lens obturation. So keep in your mind, the rule of the axis cavity is to make it as small as practical. All right. And that was the main conclusion that I am want or I want to put it in your mind. Let's see how we do this axis cavity. Here, for example, we have a distal carrier's lesion on this upper second premolar. First of all, we do, as we say, the rubber dam isolation. And here is the inversion of the rubber dam. Then I put my wedge here to support the enamel margin indeed. Then I start now with my Fisher bear to remove whole curious lesion before I start. And by the way, I was sure that this case is apical, uh, sorry, uh, uh, pulpitis or irreversible pulpitis because the patient was in pain, the signs and the symptoms before I start uh, was uh, including severe pain. And that make me a little bit sure that this case would be or would need a root canal treatment. But as you see, uh, as you see, I started to remove the caries lesion first. Here you can see some soft caries. And if we have this kind of soft caries, most probably we think, or we uh, expect that this case will need root canal treatment, of course. With the coolant, I started to remove the uh, enamel uh, unsupported board. And then I started to remove the curious dentin deeper, a little bit without coolant, because sometimes it's better to remove the soft curious without coolant. Then I started to make my seal again. I removed the previous seal, and now I'm finishing the enamel margin. 
Then I put my liquidam again to have the best seal. And then after that, I will make the de-roofing. And here, and most of the cases, I prefer to do the de-roofing with ultrasonic. Sometimes with ultrasonic normal scaling taps, sometimes with specific type of ultrasonic taps, but mainly I use the normal scaling for the periodontics scaling tap with coolant, sometimes with coolant, sometimes without coolant to do this de-roofing. And indeed in premolars, it will be easier than in molars. All right. This is mainly the axis or the daily axis cavities that we are going to do. Another video. Here, this case, unfortunately, she has the same problem. And here, as you see, with the round bear, I started to make the drop on the mesial half of the molar. As we all know, this is a first upper molar and the pulp chamber mainly in the, uh, uh, mainly in the anatomy of these upper molars will be constantly on the mesial part of the molar. Here you can see, here is a bulb drop, then I will start to do my de-roofing with ultrasonic tap. As you can see, I move from the palatal to the buccal or mainly to the mesiobuccal direction. Then I wanted or I needed to more flaring the, the walls. I found my ultrasonic tap is not very indeed will not be very cutting or efficient as the ultrasonic tab that's why i needed to extend my axis cavity a little bit so i did this flaring and now i can see the whole bulb chamber of my tooth so i can start with the ultrasonic to do some kind of axis refining as you can see, this is DG16, which is very, very important. The endodontic explorer is very, very important. And indeed, suction is very important. And if you are using a, a microscope like this, it's very important to use the high suction in, high suction in this step. And the assistant should be familiar with this. As you can see, this is the axis cavity was a sodium hypochlorite inside this uh, pulp chamber, which is very, very helpful indeed to make the toilet of the cavity. And here is our erosion orifice opener. And you can see how we start our root canal treatment. So the axis cavity with this very conservative traditional axis cavity was the concept straight line axis at least to the first curve. And this is the axis cavity. Now I'm going to talk about the middle mesial canal and the MB2 before I'm going to the shaping. By the way, the middle mesial canal, the highest percentage of the middle mesial canal are in USA or United States of America and Turkey. That's why, <clears throat> because I, I used to treat a lot of patients from Turkey and Albania and all these part of the Balkan area also. And a lot of people there, even my first patient in Albania, in Tirana, he had middle mesial canal. And I did that in front of the participant in the clinic and it was a live demonstration and he has a middle mesial, he had a middle mesial canal. So middle mesial canal simply, mainly is present, yes, how to, determine or to recognize or to shape or to locate the middle mesial canal. Look at this video and let's talk after that. Here is the first lower first molar and the middle mesial canal is mainly on the lower first or second or third molars, lower molars mainly, between the mesiobuccal canal and the mesolingual canal. First of all, you need to make asthma straffing. In every case of lower molars, you have to do this asthma straffing with ultrasonic between the mesiobuccal canal and the mesiolingual canal. 
even if you don't have a middle mesial canal, you have to do this ethmus cleaning because the root canal, it's not a root canal, it's a root canal system. Then after that, you will use DG16 or the end probe and also any kind of stiff file, but the tip is non-cutting because I don't want to make a middle mesial canal. I need to negotiate a middle mesial canal if it's there. For example, here, in this case, there is no middle mesial canal. And I showed you this case, even I don't have a middle mesial canal, just to tell you that cleaning or isthmus troughing of this part between the mesiopocal and the mesolingual canal is a must in every lower molar. You have to clean this isthmus between the mesiopocal and the mesolingual canal in the lower molars. Even if you don't have middle mesial canal, you have to clean it because it contains a lot of debris, a lot of bacteria, and you have to maximize your debridement and you have to maximize your cleaning inside the root canal system. And as I showed you, there is no middle mesial canal here. But in the next video, we have a middle mesial canal. Here, for example, we have a middle mesial canal. After cleaning the isthmus, I can see, I can recognize, I can negotiate it with a DG16 or any kind of uh, non-stiff cutting file, uh, sorry, stiff non-cutting tab uh, file like DFinder. And then after that, I start to negotiate it and shape it with, here is, for example, the Rosian orifice opener, which is a very nice or if it's opener to be used in the first two or three millimeter of negotiating the middle mesial or even the mesiobuccal canal two or MB2 that I'm going to show you on the next slide. When you negotiate a canal or a narrow canal like this, I'm completely against using best files immediately. And I know that recently on Facebook and this media, you can see I will do or I will negotiate the whole MB2 or middle mesial canal with pass file. We have this pass file. This pass file is the, fair, is the best. No, actually, I'm totally against using the best file uh, before or before using hand file first. And if you want to put your hand file inside the canal, you have to do some coronal flaring with the orifice opener first. That's why I prefer to use the orifice opener. Here for the MB2, the same protocol, and please look at this case. Here, for example, I already have uh, MB2, and after doing this, coronal flaring with Rosian orifice opener and negotiating with the DFinder, especially DFinder, I start to do my shaping with 20 or 4, 25 or 4, maximum, maximum. I, I stop at 25 or maximum 30 or 4 in some cases especially if the canal is completely separate than uh, the mesiopacal one. Here is, you can see how flexible is the erosion files, how effective on cutting, especially in such cases. But I never use the shaper files unless I have a, 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 a glide path first with the hand files. Okay, so for the axis cavity, we just revise it in one minute. You need to remove all the caries. You need to remove all the restoration. You need to make your axis cavity with a high speed bear and then do this axis refining or de-roofing with the ultrasonic that will be more conservative and will save more tooth structure. Then after that, we will start our shaping and, and our working lens determination. Of course, we all know that we are in the era of the rotary instrument, not anymore using only the hand files, but we will never stop using the hand files to tell the judgmental day, to make glide pass, apical patency, recapitulation, whatever. We will never stop using hand files, especially to make a way or make a path like a glide path for the rotary file to follow. Otherwise it will make its own path. And in some cases, or in most of cases, it will not be right way.
So, of course, we all know these advantages of the rotary endodontic instrument, and we are, the most important is faster, faster, and this is very important on this one hour or six minutes from fill, uh, drilling to filling. Now let's move to the end instruments and indeed all the rotary files we have nowadays, we have a lot of cross sections. We have a lot of different sizes, taper, metals, uh, cross sectional lengths of the cutting blades, sizes. We have a lot of things. The most important among all of that is to use a safe, efficient, effective, trustable files. And with the right uh, uh, protocol or the right sequence that you are going to use, that will be main or the main importance or the main goal that you aim. It's not about the tool, as we always say. It's all, the all important is it's all about the operator, about you, about your mind, about your sequence. That's why most of the files nowadays are, nowadays are heat rated nickel titanium or controlled memory nickel titanium files. They are mostly not bad, but the most important is to use your sequence, your mind inside the root canal, not only the file, because any kind of rotary file or any kind of nickel titanium file or any kind of metallurgy, they have advantages and they have limitations. That's why you have to completely understand the weakness point and the strongest point among your files that you are going to use. And for example, this is a sequence to be used with Rosian uh, uh, rotary files. Here in Egypt, of course, they have all the sizes and all the tables, but I always prefer to do coronal flaring first, and then I make my glide pass with hand files, and then I start my shaving with 2004 and 2504. I don't use 2506, or even you can use it in some low, uh, bigger canals, but I'm, I'm talking about the main sequence that I'm using daily in a daily practice. I use 2004, 2504, 3004. Sometimes in some cases, I go to 2506 or 3504. But as we mentioned, the concepts, the principles, the sequence that we are going to use mainly are depending on this. Straight line axis, as we mentioned, coronal flaring, as we are going to talk, and how it helps more the working lens determination, canal exploration, working lens, patency, glide bath, and recapitulation, and finally, the apical width. Everybody is asking me what size you should stop your shaving at, and we are going to mention that in a hurry. First of all, the working lens determination. And as we always say, this is a very histological diagram, diagram that we always see in our daily practice, wherever we go in any kind of text box or any kind of presentation. And the most important for me is how to determine the working lens. Where exactly should I stop my shaving? And among the methods to determine this, we have the radiograph X-ray or the old Engel method to uh, work it for working lens determination. We have the tactile sensation. We have the paper point technique. And finally, we have the main electronic apex locator. Which one of this we should depend on? Of course, of course, the working lens determination by the apex locator. But sometimes, I'm not talking here about that radiograph is not important. It is important indeed. Tactile sensation, in some cases, if you have apical constriction, is very important, and this will be enhanced in your hands and your mentality with the experience. And the paper point technique, indeed, it's very important in some cases that you cannot depend on this or that, like open apex, so for example. Sometimes I depend more on the paper point technique. So they are all very important, but the most important one is the ABEX locator because in 99% of our daily breaks, we have to believe only on the ABEX locator. The history of ABEX locator, we are not going to talk about this. We have up till now six generations, the first and the second generation, and the third generation, starting from the third generation, we started to use the evidence or the frequency. 
That's why most of the ABEX locators that we have in our daily practice now are mainly multiple frequency ABEX locator. And starting from the third generation to the sixth generation, up till now, the method of using the ABEX locator are the same. And this is the most important not to revise only that the first generation was resistance, the first, second generation was endings, the third generation, no. The most important for me, of course, it's important theoretical part, but the most important for me is how to use it. That's why this is what I'm, I'm going to say or to mention now. First of all, the advantages of any ABEX locator are easier, faster. You can use it repeatedly without using X-ray. And really, this is very important. So, before using the ABEX locator, I always prefer to make coronal flaring. Why? All the studies stated that coronal flaring is very, very useful for the working lens determination. So what is the coronal flaring? It's simply to make the coronal one third wider. Using what? Use Rogen orifice opener or any kind of orifice opener. That will be helpful in what? First, it will prevent pushing the debris more ibical. Second, you will have better tactile sensation with the hand files that you are going to use for working lens determination or for canal exploration or even for the glide path. And the third and the most important or what is related to what I'm talking about here is the working lens. The working lens measurement is more um, accurate when you do the coronal pre-flaring. And the most of the studies and here is a systematic review talking about the effect of the coronal flaring on the accuracy of the AVEX locator. And it concluded that it improves the accuracy of the measurement of locating of the AVEX locator. So please, before you start to take your working lens, do some coronal flaring with the origin, uh, with, sorry, uh, with Rogen orifice opener. So after doing the coronal flaring, I will take my working lens. So I did my axis cavity, then immediately after the axis cavity and I locate the whole canals, I start to do coronal flaring with the orifice opener to only coronal one third. And then I will start to take my working lens determination. I heard about that, you always tell me this. I heard that we should finish our shaping to the zero point. Somebody else know 0.5 shorter than the working lens, or sorry, the tooth lens. That will be my working lens. Either this school or that school, they all depend on the zero, zero reading. What is the zero, the zero reading? It is the only accurate measurement taken or produced by the ABEX locator, or you take from the ABEX locator. And as you can see, here is a zero reading. So to have it in an accurate way, you have to pass beyond the ABEX, only 0.5 millimeter or even less. You have to close the circuit. And then after that, you will go back to the zero reading. Either you will subtract 0.5 or not, you have to depend mainly on this zero reading. For me, I always subtract 0.5 millimeter from this zero reading, and I always shave my canal 0.5 millimeter shorter than the tooth lens to make epical stop. And this is my protocol. This is what I'm using in my daily clinical practice. So in some cases, if you have meta restoration, there is a small trick, you can just put any kind of Teflon all around the hand file you are going to use. So the canal should be dry, completely dry or completely wet, neither nor. The canal should be semi-wet, semi-wet. And that semi-wet will be the best when you do coronal flaring before you start to take your working glass. In wide canals, you need wider or sorry, bigger size files because the most appropriate way for the file to take the working lens is when the file is a little bit engaging to the dental walls, especially on the apical 
part. And of course, you have to check your battery because if you have a low battery or low voltage, you can make it make errors. So it should be charged very well. So our working lens determination protocol is first, coronal flaring. Second, taking my working lens with k file number eight or 10. Then I start my cleaning and shaping and prepare to 0.5 millimeter, 0.5 millimeter shorter than the tooth lens. And then, and this is very important, I will not take the working lens with the Apex locator one time. No, at least two times. And the second time should be before the last finishing file. For example, if I shave up to 30 or four, and when I shave 25 or four, I go inside the canal again, and I start to take my working lens again, because sometimes in curved canals with shaving, it can make the working lens shorter. That's why I reassure or re-measure or recheck the working lens before the last finishing file. Very good. Let's see how we do it. Here, after making the axis cavity, coronal flaring, as we mentioned, here is the orifice opener. Without any measurements, yes, because I will put my orifice opener only to the one third of the canal. How you? How can you know that this is a one third of the canal? Simply it's three to four millimeter of the canal because mainly the root canals, mainly anatomically, the length of the root canals from nine to 12 millimeters in 90, 90 uh, uh, percent of the cases. That's why three, four millimeter inside the canal will be very good. And you can see I clean, clean, clean. Now here is the semi wet condition, which is favorable for any kind of hand files for to take the working lens with the ABEX locator. So now I know I make my axis cavity in five minutes. I did coronal flaring. I took my working lens. Now I start to shave. But before shaving, I need to understand some sort of concepts we are going to use daily in our daily practice because I always say, that using the rotary uh, files, it's a pyramid based on three points. The first point is coronal flaring, and we did it. That will help and help, help. And we, we, all, we mentioned all the advantages. Second is glide bass. And the third is apical patency and recapitulation. What is glide bass? Glide bass is simply to make a path with hand file or even with the rotary files. Lately, we used the nickel titanium to do this, especially when we have a little bit uh, the more advanced nickel titanium nowadays. And mainly we use it with hand file. I always use hand file. They claim that with 10 or 12 or up to 15, I always use K file number 10 only. And then after that, I start to use any kind of uh, trustable rotary bath file like Rosian bath file. And actually they are one of the best best files you can use in your daily practice. Cleaning and shaving. Cleaning and shaving, as we all know, cleaning, mainly the irrigation, and we are going to talk about this uh, lately, but shaving, shaving with the rotary files. Of course, you know Rosian rotary files. Of course, you know Rosian super flex file, especially super flex file, because of their characteristic cross section and their characteristic sequence, which is my favorite sequence, which is Taper 04. I always prefer to do the coronal flaring with the orifice opener and then. If the canal is tight, I may use the bath file, the rotary bath file. But if not tight, I, all, I go directly to 20 or 4, 25 or 4, 30 or 4 in most of cases, but in wider canals or in some cases, I go to 35 or 4. And actually, this sequence is my favorite sequence for the cases. And the cross section of this erosion uh, gold files are one of the best to be used in our daily clinical practice because really it can, it's very effective and also it's very, very flexible. And indeed in shaving, we need both of that. We need 
the file to be effective in cutting and also to be flexible with a degree of flexibility to respect the canal anatomy. Then the patency. Patency, indeed, patents mean the ABEX is patent. And indeed, we don't make the ABEX patent with very big files. No, we will not do this violation. But we always say we do this patency only with K file number 10. And this is very important to decrease the post-operative pain, decrease the dental mud, the debris uh, trapped in this part, to decrease every, everything. It's very important. Don't think that you will harm the periapical tissues. No, indeed, no. Now, after that, I will go to the irrigation and the irrigation protocol, which is the cleaning part. And of course, we know that the ideal irrigant that we are going to use should be bactericidal, remove the smear layer, lubricate the canal, dissolve phytal and necrotic tissues, and how to activate this irrigant with sonic or even with ultrasonic. The properties of ideal irrigant, as we mentioned, are all of that. But the most important part is to know that sodium hypochlorite, sodium hypochlorite, our holy irrigation liquid, is the main. I will just upload the whole slide and then I will talk about it. Sodium hypochlorite, our holy solution, is the main irrigation solution that you, we use in a daily clinical practice. It does everything, everything except removing the smear layer. That's why I go to EDTA solution to remove the smear layer. Here is my irrigation protocol. First, during the shaping, of course, I use a sodium hypochlorite. And between each file, rotary file and the other, we have to irrigate and recapitulate with hand file. And then after you completely finish your shaving, you start to do irrigation with EDTA solution and with activation for one minute to remove the smear layer. Then I separate with, cold, with normal saline for each canal. And then I start to use the sodium hypochlorite again to go inside the canal and start to uh, increase my um, uh, effect of the bactericidal effect of the sodium hypochlorite inside the dentinal tubules and in, uh, the penetration inside the, the dentinal tubules. And then at the end, I use the cold saline for a final wash uh, for one minute just uh, to clean the canals and also because I'm using bioceramic sealers. And then all the studies also stated that using cold saline for one minute as a final uh, wash will decrease the post-operative pain. Here is the irrigation protocol again. It is the same, but with different slide. If you want to take a picture or screenshot or whatever, because I always use that in my daily clinical practice. It's the same, the same, the same. Then after that, I'm going to talk the obturation. Obturation, as we all know, we need to stop the coronal leakage, we need to stop the epical leakage, and we need to entomb any kind of surviving bacteria inside the dentinal tubules. So I need to have a good, a good seal, three-dimensional seal inside the canal, I'm sorry. Usually, or traditionally, conventionally, we use a cold technique, and I know that most of my colleagues are using the cold letter condensation up till now. But the most important of cold letter condensation is to use it in the right technique. So I will upload the whole slide and I will talk about the right way to use the cold letter condensation. First of all, cold letter condensation is a pyramid also, a pyramid with three corner stools. The first corner stool is a selection of the master tool. The idea of taking <clears throat> a tag back in cold letter condensation, it's a myth. You will not have uh, the perfect tag back if you are going to use the cold letter condensation in the right way. Why? Because simply, if you, for example, shave your canal to 3004, you have to put master cone 30 indeed, but with smaller taper like 3002. Why? to allow for any uh, kind of accessory or auxiliary get a burka cocoons. And of course the spreader. So you will not have this kind of perfect tag back. 
So the most important is to check the retention and resistant form. More is the resistant form. Is the resistant form is the Gatterberg cocoon will not go beyond the uh, epical stop you already created. So the selection of the master cone, the first cornerstone is to use the same size, but with less or different table. Then after that, you have to isolate and dry the canal, and then you check the master cone for the resistance the retention form, and then you will start your <clears throat> sealer, whatever, bioceramic or resin or whatever, and you have to understand that in lateral condensation, you are depending more on the sealer, not on the Gatterberka. Then you will put your master cone to tell the working lens, and then, of course, after filling the canal with the, with the sealer. And for me, I prefer with this technique to use bioceramic sealer. And nowadays we have uh, Schieber bioceramic sealers all over the world. Then after that, the second cornerstone is the right choice of the spreader. You have to choose the right spreader that can go inside the canal up to one, two millimeter shorter than the working lens. It's very important. So if you put, for example, the, the blue one, which is 30, and it didn't reach two millimeter shorter than the working lens, you have to go to the smaller red one, for example. The second is the right choice of the auxiliary. For example, if you choose here, or you, you did choose here the blue spreader, which is 30, you have to use what kind of auxiliary? 30? No, you have to use 25, smaller auxiliary than the size of the spreader. Why? Because the Gatterberka is a, is a rubbery elastic material and it will just go back again after you compact it laterally with the spreader. The cold lateral condensation or cold lateral convection, it has certain advantages indeed, especially the working lens uh, control. But also it has some sort of disadvantages like the voids and increase the sealer get a better ratio because you are bending more on the sealers. That's why I prefer with cold lateral condensation to use bioceramic sealer and in the second rank, resin sealer, but of course not zinc side initial. For the warm techniques, it's mainly, we are using mainly the heat to heat in the Gatterberka. So we depend more here on the Gatterberka. Mainly, we have, called, uh, we have warm vertical convection and we have continuous wave convection and the modifications and, 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 but mainly I will talk here about the steps of the main warm vertical convection. The master cone, same size, same taper. Yes, here you will have the right tug back and you will have the right retention and resistance form. And you have to know that up till now, cold letter condensation, cold letter condensation is not considered as uh, obturation or acceptable obturation technique, unfortunately. So after you boot your master cone and you check it, you have to check the heat plugger that you are going to use of system B, and then you will put your sealer and then you will put your uh, master cone and cut the master cone with the heated blogger five, uh, sorry, three to five millimeters shorter than the working lens. And then you will inject the Gatterberka and come back, inject and come back. This is mainly the warm vertical convection, but actually the bioceramic sealer are not heat tolerable or heat loving uh, sealers. Uh, they don't like or don't tolerate the heat of uh, uh, system B or whatever the device you are going to use. That's why we need to take the best of this warm convection and the best of the sealers. And we need to have more or less a combination between both of them. That's why this is the technique that I'm using in my daily practice, which is hot modified technique, which were or which originally and mainly and firstly described by my dear great friend, Dr. Alfredo Andolu and Dr. Dina uh, Abdel Latif. They are the owners of this great techniques. And actually since seven years, I'm using this technique in my daily practice and it gave me the best results with bioceramic and with hot uh, devices or system B. Simply, I will just tell you how we do it. First of all, I dry the canal with one paper point only. 
because bioceramic sealer loves water. So we don't need a very dry canal. Second, we put the master cone. We have to check the master cone, retention and resistance form. We have to check the plugger. We have to check the hand plugger and we have to check the heated plugger that we are going to use. And then after that, I will, uh, I need to check where exactly or to check what? I need to check my heat blogger and my hand blogger not to be three, five millimeters shorter. No, here it's only five, seven millimeter shorter than the working lens. And then I start to inject my bioceramic sealer. And this is very important. That's why I will show you this video. Here we have two problems. Here, the tip of the bioceramic sealer should not be, yes. Here, as you can see, it's locked. This is wrong. It should not be locked inside the canal. It should be, you should go inside the canal. And then after that, you go outside the canal one millimeter after the first engagement and then start to inject slowly in a backward action, slowly. And second problem here was very fast injection on the second step. So do not do this. You have to go inside the canal until you get the first lock or the first engagement, then you go back one millimeter so the tip is free. And then I start to inject my bioceramic in a very slowly way in a backward motion. Then after that, I will put my master cone. Then I will get my heated plugger and go inside the canal five, seven millimeters shorter. If you cannot go directly to this five, seven millimeters shorter in one shot, you can make it in another shot. Not important to make it in a one one stroke. You can make it in two or three even strokes. Then after that, you will start to come back with the hand blogger, and then you will start to inject this five seven millimeter or the the remaining five to uh, seven millimeter. You will inject it in one or two strokes with the heated thermoblast sized caterpillar. This is how you, we, I do it in my daily practice. And I will show you now how I did it. Here is the first or the one paper point. Then I check my master cone for retention and resistance form. And as you can see, here is a confirmatory working lens. It's not important, not, not, not a must. Then I start to inject my bioceramic sealer. And I tiered here only from the orifice or the coronal part, just to make it easier for me to inject the bioceramic also and put the master cone on the other canal. And then I also tiered here, as you can see. And then I will start to go the five, seven millimeters shorter. And then after that, after compacting, I will start to uh, inject my thermoblast size get burka and back for the re remaining five, seven millimeter. And of course, you, you may think that it's not five, seven millimeter, but because of the depth on the, mic on the video of the microscope, uh, you, you, we don't have this third dimension of the depth on the video under the microscope. How to clean the bioceramic sealer? Very, very easily with ultrasound and water. If resin, we need to clean it with alcohol or a lot of things we need to clean the axe cavity after using the resin sealer. That's why bioceramic sealer actually is very, very good to enhance or to help us to have this 60 minutes from drilling to filling. And here is after obturation and the composite restoration because the time is, and here is after we finish. Another case, here we have a broken file in the uh, radix intumularis. After we remove the crown, we made the isolation. With the ultrasonic, we do some access refining, sometimes with coolant, sometimes without coolant. Why access refining? To remove all the uh, coronal gutta burka. I don't know why. And then after that, you can see here is the mesobuccal and the mesolingual distobuccal and the <clears throat> broken file in the distolingual canal. So I will first start to remove the uh, file in the distolingual canal. 
with ultrasonic and then after that i will take because it's not the topic of what we are going to talk today then after that i will use the leo pen to take the file out as you will see here after engaging with the, uh, the file with the leo pen we remove the file so we are going now that was in 20 minutes or 25 minutes I will start now to remove the Gata Perka with the, one of the best Gata Perka remover retreatment files, Rojan retreatment files. I say it very loud. One of the best files to remove the Gata Perka are Rojan retreatment files. They are really, you can see how take the Gata Perka all around it, one of the best. Then after that, I started to shave with 20, 25, 30, or 4. The same visit. You can see how the curve, it's very weird curve, negotiated with this kind of rotary files. And here is the irrigation. You can see, ah, yes, I have to get back. You can see here this Ismut part. With the Gata Birka inside, I have to clean it with Isthmus with ultrasonic device. So we need to clean this and do Isthmus troughing for one or two millimeter. And then after that, I will start to remove the remaining Gata Birka. Here is to negotiate the distolingual canal with the hand files first. And here you see the Rojan best file. As I told you, one of the best files to be used to negotiate the canal. And as you can see, all negotiated, but my files were fatigued. So here, as you can see, 2004, after negotiating all these curves, unfortunately, it was separated. And they are really nice to be easily bypassed after that with the hand files Defender, my warrior, and with the reciprocating hand piece, I could be able to bypass it in, let's say, 15 minutes maximum. And once I got the negotiation and once I bypassed it, you can see now I use the final file, the final Rosian 30 of 4 1. Here is the distal buckle. And you will see even here is the mesolingual. The mesu buckle. It respects the curve. Yes, it respects the curve. And now to the distolingual with the broken file, you will see here is the engagement. Even you can see the file is moving because of the engagement. Yes, we use it in bypassing. Yes, of course, you can depend it on bypass. Yes, indeed. Of course, after bypassing with hand files, you can see the master cone. Here is the master cone. You can see the deep epical split here on the mesial and the dovetail on the distal. Well, uh, even the negative, you can see the deep epical split and obturated and shaped and so I always say Rojan files are one of the best files you can use on bypassing indeed, on daily practice indeed, in shaving indeed. Thank you so much. And the main goal of this webinar is to do, or to consider that one hour, 60 minutes from drilling to filling is the main object in your daily practice because single visit is one of the best ways to have a great success rate in your daily practice for row canal treatments. Thank you so much. And indeed using Rogen files is one of the best options to be used on retreatment and also in daily shaping. Now, I guess we will see the questions. Hi, Ted, are you there? Okay. Now let's see the questions. 
First of all, we have uh, the first question. Do you think the torque and speed need to be changed for each file system or what do you think the best torque and speed? The best torque and speed to be used with any kind of any rotary file should be according to the manufacturer structure. According to the manufacturer instructions. If the manufacturer say it's 300 RBM or 1.5 Newton per centimeter torque, so you follow it. Do not change the torque and speed uh, rather than what the manufacturers say it, because they tried it so much and the best is what they are giving you. So do not change the torque and speed for each file. According to the manufacturer instructions, use it. We have another question, which file you use to treat calcified canals according to the case. By the way, calcification always start on the coronal part. Calcification, as we say, always start on the coronal part. So once you open the calcification on the coronal or even up to the middle part, it will be easier later on the apical part. For me, I always use Rogen orifice opener. Once I did ultrasonic trapping, once I did negotiation with DG16, once I started to, under the magnification, to negotiate or to see that there, here is the difference between or according to the outline, here is the point of the entry uh, that I'm going to go inside, I use the Rogen orifice opener because I can a little bit make some force on it. How to do the apical gauging? The apical gauging, usually we do it with the hand files, like K files, but as I, I, I know or as a come to my knowledge that the best file to do it was light speed or LS or um, yes, light speed file, because it can take the only taper of the apical part for the apical ga uh, gauging or gauging. You can use a K file. This is the second uh, choice we, we have in our daily practice. You can use it. You can use a K file, it's fine. Uh, another question, you use ceramic sealer with warm vertical conditions that by some, yes, that's why I said I use it with hot modified technique. Maybe Mohammed, you came later. Uh, please uh, look at the presentation from the beginning. You will see that I used the biosomic sealer with a hot modified technique because the temperature, it will be 150. I advise all of you to uh, see this uh, or to read this article uh, of the hot modified technique by Alfredo Yandolo, you will see that we only use the temperature 150, not 200 or 250 like uh, with the continuous wave compaction. And also we use it uh, in for two, three seconds only. And we depend more on the pressure and the speed, not on the temperature. That's why it has certain characteristic you have to read about or read the article of hot modified technique. Another question, do you use chlorhexidine? No, I don't. I don't use chlorhexidine in my practice at all. Do you need to reverse the speed for retreatment? No, 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 no. The files, the rotary files, the Rosian rotary retreatment files, that are used to remove the gutta are used on the same rotation motion with the forward, not the backward or not counterclockwise. No, no, no. It is designed mainly to do this in a rotation motion. What is the sequence of ultrasonic use for coronal troughing? I can't get the question, but if you mean the characteristic of ultrasonic troughing or coronal troughing uh, for the isthmus troughing, for example, uh, maximum the depth of this isthmus troughing should be one to two millimeter. If, if, if that's what I'm understanding. I think there is another modification of PC called high flow. They claim exactly as you say, they claim, they claim it's not right. They claim it can tolerate heat, but it's not right. They are the same actually they just added some opacifiers so it look in the x-ray more radio opaque but they claim it's not there is no pipe ceramic sealer that can tolerate heat 100 percent or even 75 percent no 
So we have to modify the technique to use it with a five ceramic sealer. But actually, the high flow what you that you mean with uh, from FKJ that can tolerate heat? No, it cannot. Uh, what are the file numbers that you used? In which case? Uh, in, in most of the cases, the sequence that I mentioned was the orifice opener and then 20 or 4, 25 or 4, 30 or 4. Sometimes in very uh, tight cases, I use bath file. And sometimes in very wide cases, I use 35 or even 25 or 6. What do you use for corona restoration after obturation? As I show it on uh, my uh, video, in that case, I used composite restoration. I always use uh, bulk fill composite, uh, snow plow technique, or the injection molding technique, the uh, uh, flowable composite, flowable bulk fill composite, and backable bulk fill composite. And accordingly, to the case, sometimes we need Casper coverage, sometimes we need crown, sometimes we need onlay, sometimes we need overlay according to the case. What they do in open ABEX uh, cases, cements I mean. In open ABEX cases, I prefer to use MTA, like MTA putty. And we have a lot of MTA putties nowadays in the market and they are good, not expensive, and you can use it. And for me, the open ABEX, uh, traditionally, the open AVEX is above 70, but now, even now, some, some, some studies or some uh, endodontists prefer above 50 even, above size 50 AVEX or diameter, they use or they start to use MTA body to have a better apical seal. Any other questions? Thank you so much. And I would like to thank Rogen Dental Company for this great opportunity to be among all of you. And I'm so happy actually to give this webinar on Ramadan and happy Ramadan. And uh, thank you so much. Ted, are you there? Hey. Ted, I think that the presentation is a little bit late. That's why they, they cannot hear me. Hello, Dr. Curdy. Hi, uh, Ted. Yeah, yeah, sorry, I forgot to uh, 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 open the, the video. Uh, oh, so, That's fine. And, and I'm saying that uh, thank you for all the answers and for the, this wonderful and the detailed knowledge sharing. And uh, I think the uh, audience are really happy with uh, this webinar. And if uh, they are missing some points, uh, we will put uh, the whole video on our Facebook page so they, they can check Great. again. Okay. Very good. Thank okay. you, Ted. Thank you also, and thank you for your time. And we hope we will have uh, more opportunities like this in the future uh, sure. to do this uh, knowledge sharing and to be with all, all, all of our, uh, our friends. Thank you so much. And thanks for the all attendance. Thank you.